everybody knows that the players or um, actors on the Shakespearean stage were boys. There's a great line in Anthony and Cleopatra where Cleopatra talks about some squeaking Cleopatra boying her greatness in some mocking performance later after her fall. But the Shakespearean theater was by no means all male. And I've, Natasha Corda's work has shown sort of tradeswomen and craftswomen who made costumes, they made wigs, they worked in the industries surrounding and supporting the theater. They financed plays and, and playbooks. Other work has shown that women played a, a role in yeah, printing playbooks. And of course, women were members of the audience, often rowdy members of the audience, and not just prostitutes, the much discussed prostitutes in the Shakespearean audiences, but also ladies and merchants' wives and tradeswomen. And uh, there's a great scene at the very end of As You Like It when the boy player playing Rosalind comes onto the stage and tells the women um, as much as they like the play to applaud for it. So there's sort of a direct address to women in the audience. Gender was also thematically really, really important for Shakespeare. And we see this most famously perhaps in The Taming of the Shrew, right? Which is a play about the taming of a sort of a wild and irreverent woman named Kate by a a patriarch named Petruchio. And this story is often seen as, or was often seen as sort of representing the subordination of women in marriage and indeed the taming of marriage necessary in Elizabethan and Jacobean England and Shakespearean England. But, you know, there's a lot of feminist critics who have pointed out, I think quite rightly, that speaking a discourse isn't exactly the same thing as living according to its dictates. So. Kate has these lines where she, at the end of the play, she says, thy husband is thy lord, thy life, thy keeper, thy head, thy sovereign, such a duty as the subject owes to the prince, even such a woman oweth to her husband. So of course it all depends not only on how one says those lines, how seriously or with which, what kind of irony, but the fact that those lines were, people were very used to subjecting those to debate, to saying, well, no, she actually, the subject doesn't know the prince everything. The subject has rights too. One of the scenes that I think about most along these lines, and my favorite scene to teach in many ways, is a scene in Othello where Desdemona is listening to Iago go on about women, these old commonplaces about women, how they talk too much, how they're hellcats in the kitchen, etc. And she interrupts him at some point to say, Ah, yes, these are old, fond paradoxes used to make fools and laugh in the alehouse. She's making the point that they're bar jokes, right? They're just misogynistic sententia, and they don't actually have anything to do with real women or how they live. And when Desdemona is dead at the end of the play, and Amelia is, is fighting to expose what happened, and Iago's telling her to shut up and get inside, she speaks these amazing lines where she says, "'Tis proper, I obey him." This is what she's telling the Venetian men but not now, and perhaps I'll never go home. And her last words, or among her last words in the play, are lay me by my mistress's side. And it's a line I love because it shows how this relationship between women serves as a caution, right, on and a critique of male tyranny and overwhelming violence and power. And their bodies, right, if you think about the staging of the play, their bodies lying together on the bed are really an emblem of this kind of resistance. There's also a lot of play on how clothes make the man and the woman, um, and how important costume was, right? People become men by putting on double and hose or wielding swords. And like now, the presentation or performance of gender was a sort of determinative of, of somebody's gender identity, whether they were a man and woman as biological sex ever was. This was true about biological sex itself, which was determined in the Renaissance largely by humoral ideas, right? That every body had a balance of humors and it was differences in heat and moisture, as well as by a strangely homologous understanding of, of sexual difference. Um, the, the period abounded in stories of women overheatedly leaping across rivers and suddenly pop becoming men. So it had a very fluid period and the culture had a very fluid idea, actually, of sexual difference in many ways.